All right, let's get started. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us. This is the first in our marketing series, and we're excited. Um, I have Alex and Katie with us today. Uh, I'm new to this. I'm very. Uh, I only started with SVP two months ago, so my name is Maranisa. I'm the new operations and engagement manager here. And as I mentioned earlier, we have Alex and Katie with us. They're both marketing professionals and really good at what they do. And I'm very excited for what they're presenting today because I know I'm gonna use this in my role here as well. And this is perfect for charities and small businesses that have more than one, that have one person that's doing more than one role, including marketing. Um, so I'm just getting started. We have about 40, 45 minutes for their presentation. And then from there, we'll have a Q and A session. There is a little box down there, so feel free to throw in your questions and I'll run with them at the end of the session. And we do um, have a couple more marketing sessions after this, so please feel free. I'll reiterate this at the end, but please feel free to send me your information, any ideas, suggestions for the next one. So with that, Alex, take it away. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and share the screen for Katie. Hopefully everyone can see that, yeah. Uh, thanks everyone. Um, so Alex, do you wanna to go to the first slide? All right. So compelling storytelling is one of the most important aspects of any marketing strategy. Um, when it's done right, it can be an extremely valuable tool for any brand uh, looking to reach or connect with their audience. Unfortunately, time and resources are just who are the things that you need most to pull this off, and they are often in short supply, especially for organizations who have limited resources. Um, the good news is though that you don't need a huge multi-million dollar budget to reach your audience. You can still get your message out there, you just have to be smart and strategic about it. Luckily, with the rise of the internet and digital spaces, we are more connected than ever, and it's making it a lot easier to achieve this. Um, so I'm going to start off today by taking a look at digital storytelling and some of the online tools that you can use to leverage storytelling, as well as discussing how to engage your audience online, even if you have limited resources. And then I'm going to pass it over to Alex, who will talk a little bit more about creating and leveraging context so that you can make the most impact. Um, so to start off, I'm just going to take a look at what exactly is storytelling. So storytelling is exactly what you think it is. It's the process of using fact or narrative to communicate a message to your audience and evoke an emotional response. Through storytelling, people can learn more about who you are, um, what you represent, why you exist, and why they should support you. No matter which channel or medium you decide to use, the key elements are the ability to convey what is unique about your organization and why it is worthy of support. Digital storytelling enables organizations of all kinds to use online tools to tell their stories across multiple channels and forge relationships with people that they may not otherwise be able to connect with. Um, when it's done well, it can bring you in front of any audience that you want and really forge an emotional relationship. So some of the most common tools that are used for online, um, sorry, online tools for storytelling are your own website, um, which is really where you should be driving most of your traffic to blog posts or just your content, um, external partners, any influencers in your space, email, SMS, messaging outreach, search engines like Google, um, Bing, or even YouTube, online advertising, and social media, which is what we'll be focusing most of today's discussion on. Um, in today's world, it's easier than ever to find ways to connect. Um, even with limited resources, there are so many tools available that it can be hard to narrow down which ones to use. So the channels that you use will depend almost entirely on what the story is that you're trying to tell as well as the audience that you need to use to tell that story. Um, okay, so the first step to engage with the digital audience is you need to decide what it is that you want them to know and what the, sto what the story is that you're trying to tell. So some examples of potential messages or goals could be building brand awareness, um, what it is that your charity or nonprofit does, what are you trying to do, um, you could be promoting a cause or a service. Um, you could have a fundraising goal. You could be encouraging memberships, donations, um, engaging with volunteers, or just simply driving political or social change. So identifying what the problem is that you're trying to solve and why it's important. When choosing your key message, you should also consider how you want people to feel when they hear your story. Evoking emotion is a very powerful component of storytelling, and being able to do this is where you'll see the most impact. Um, also, knowing your message will help you determine which channels and what type of content will probably work the best for you. So 
So the next step with engaging your digital audience is um, identifying what that audience is. So once you know the message, you need to determine who it is that you want to hear. The who is very important because um, it'll really determine which platforms you use uh, moving forward. So some examples of audience could be donors, existing or potential, um, volunteers, existing or potential, clients or anyone else that uses your services, other key stakeholders. Um, it could be people that know who you are or it could be people that have never heard of you. You might have more than one audience or your audience could change depending on what your goal is at any given time. Um, next slide. So one of the best ways that um, you can tell your story is through your own social media networks. Every organization should be taking advantage of your social channels. Um, they connect you with your community directly and in today's world is where most people spend their time. Um, for example, in 2021, the average user will spend 145 minutes per day on social media, which is almost two and a half hours daily. And that works out to about 15% of their waking life. Uh, more than half of the world's population, so around 4 billion people, use social media in some capacity on a daily basis. And Facebook has just over 2 billion active users every day. So all of this to say that people just spend a lot of time online. And if you aren't there, it could be hard to get your message in front of them. Um, so social media channels are a relatively easy, effective way to distribute content to a wide audience. Um, they are great to use as a tool to promote awareness, to build communities, to inspire action, and to share impact. Um, but as I said, there are so many options to choose from that when it comes to social media, it can be very overwhelming and confusing where to start. So how do you decide which platforms you should be using? First, consider the following uh, in next slide. So what role do you want social media to play in your overall strategy? And how are you gonna be using it? Um, where is your audience? Do you need to take into consideration things like age or salary level? Um, and also what are the goals and how will they be measured? So just make sure that your goals around social media are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound, because it'll really help gauge your performance. And remember, you don't have to use every social media platform. In fact, it's better to focus on one or two and do those well, rather than try to be everywhere at once and overextend yourself. Um, always think back to what your main message is and what your audience is. So next slide. <clears throat> So when you are considering which uh, channels to start with, as I said, think back to your audience, where are they most likely to be? And where is it most likely that your story will be impactful? Each social media platform is best suited for something different. So let's take a look at some of the biggest ones. All right, Facebook, um, with almost 3 billion monthly active users, Facebook is the most used and most engaged with social media network. Um, over 83% of Canadians have a Facebook account and it consistently ranks as the top platform for adults with over half of its users falling into the age range of 18 to 34. Um, the platform tends to be emotion driven and is a place where people wanna connect with friends and family, in addition to the brands and organizations that they enjoy and trust. The posts that typically work best on this platform are those that inspire conversation and enhance trust. Typically a person will spend about 35 minutes per day on Facebook and on Facebook, you should share photos, updates, and general news in a way that is engaging to your audience so that they will like, share, comment um, on your posts. Since many users rely on Facebook to connect with friends and family, it's important that you don't use a really salesy approach to your posts or they'll most likely be ignored. Um, Facebook is a fairly easy platform to navigate and it has both Messenger and a fundraising feature. Um, so they recently added a donate button, which is a quick way for people to donate to your organization without actually leaving the platform. Um, and you can add that button to your page, post, and live video, making it easy for supporters to contribute in just a few taps. Um, Instagram is probably the next largest social network. It is a visual platform with over 1 billion monthly users. People can capture, edit, and share photos and videos and messages. Um, you can use Instagram to take your followers behind the scenes, expand your reach with hashtags, and highlight new initiatives or any upcoming events that you might have. Um, most users of Instagram fall between the age range of 18 to 24, which is a great um, nonprofit demographic. And then the next largest one is actually that 30 to 49 age range. So they've got a very wide demographic covered. Um, 
You can showcase your story on Instagram by creating shareable content that entices users to tag and share with friends, and that will help you expand your reach on this platform. Um, Instagram has also recently introduced donate buttons, which allows nonprofits to raise money directly from their Instagram business account as well, um, just making it a little easier for users. LinkedIn is um, it's specifically designed for businesses and professionals, but that doesn't mean it should be overlooked by nonprofits. Um, as a professional networking site, it's a place of learning. Users typically rely on it to expand their expertise and learn more about an industry. Um, it's an excellent platform for B2B companies to reach their target audience um, and to drive traffic while establishing thought leadership and recruit employees. But it can be great for other organizations as well as a tool to build credibility and to connect with business leaders and potential donors. Twitter is typically where people will go for news and live event updates. It can be a great tool for building brand awareness. Um, users typically don't spend a lot of time on this platform, but that is more so because of the nature of the app. Users are going to it to stay up to date on trending topics and events in real time with quick bite-sized updates. Um, this is also a good place for people to communicate directly with organizations that they follow. Um, so tip for Twitter, you would wanna share quotes, stats, or news with links to your website or landing pages and use hashtags to help reach a wider audience. Um, picking the right hashtags can significantly boost the reach of your posts. Um, in Canada, only about 42% of Canadians actually have a Twitter account, um, but 80% of the users are categorized as affluent millennials, so it could have some, um, some use. YouTube is a very powerful platform as, a video con as video content becomes more and more important in the digital marketing space. YouTube is becoming increasingly, increasingly popular um, for vlogs and other types of video content. It's usually longer form, um, and then it's fairly evenly broken down across all demographics as per users. It's also the second used, most used search engine, and people watch about a billion hours of YouTube videos each day, like as a population. Um, as an organization, you can use it to share anything from how-to guides or instructional videos to more polished fundraising videos. Um, and you really wanna remember with the video that on YouTube specifically, the quality is very important. Um, and then TikTok. So TikTok is a new fast growing video platform and it's highly geared to a younger generation. Um, most users are under the age of 30. It's rapidly growing in popularity and it's very short form video content. So it's highly addictive. People will just spend hours scrolling through it. So it has really high engagement levels. And if you can make it work for your organization, it could be valuable. Um, as a rule of thumb though, it is easier to manage if you choose to have a strong consistent presence on one or two platforms rather than trying to juggle a whole, bun juggle a whole bunch of them. You can always try new platforms once you've mastered one or two. Um, next slide. So you made some social media profiles, you have an online presence, now what? It isn't enough to just have a profile, you need to engage with your audience. But what does this mean? So engaging with your audience simply means getting them interested in your message or your story and interacting with them. Engagement could be post shares, it could be likes, comments, views, link clicks, uh, mentions. But remember that it goes two ways on social media. It isn't just about posting your own content, you need to be engaging with others and participating. Um, this will really help you reach a wider audience. Some ways that you can engage with your own audience would be ask questions in your posts, use polls, um, tag other accounts, especially ones that might be able to contribute to whatever you're posting or that might find it interesting. Um, use images or videos. These can really help with engagement, especially videos. Uh, respond to comments, use hashtags, and share content from other relevant accounts that might be interested in your audience. Depending on your resources, you can spend as little or as much time as you want on social media, but you can't really just leave it and hope for the best. You do need to engage at some level. Um, okay, next. So managing your social media channels. The best way to foster engagement is by posting and sharing consistent relevant content. So stuff that your audience wants to see and that they will find interesting. Um, always remember who is following you and think, what would they want to hear and what is it going to add to your story? Um, some potential updates that you could use for your social media would be impact or success stories. This could be your main type of content because it will have the most impact and this is where you can really use your storytelling. 
Um, you might also want to post nonprofit news about any upcoming events that are coming up, as well as campaign goal progress or any new campaigns that are coming. A good rule to follow is the 70-20-10 rule. So 70% of your content should be news or impact related and 20% should be shared content from your audience. And then 10% should be promotional or ask based content. A common question is how often should you post? And typically the more active you are, the better, but you don't wanna sacrifice quality for quantity. Um, relevance and usefulness should always be more important than frequency of posts. So you wanna make sure that you're posting consistently, but if you only have the bandwidth to post a couple of times a week, it is better to do that rather than overextend yourself. Um, some platforms might perform better with more posts like Twitter, usually and Instagram, but you need to find the posting frequency that works best for your organization. And that might take some trial and error and just adjusting. Other ways to manage your social media networks would be to create a content calendar and plan out your posts for the month. Um, that will help make sure that you post consistently and with quality content and take some of the pressure off of trying to come up with post ideas on the morning of. Um, it also helps to ensure that your posts are cohesive and contribute to your overall storytelling goals. There are also services that you can use to schedule posts and make it a bit easier on yourself. I'm not going to go into that too much today, but it is an option to be aware of. Um, some of them are free, some of them are paid, and some examples would be like Hootsuite, TweetDeck, Sprout Social, and Socialbee. Next. Another important thing to know is when you should shut a channel down. Not every channel is going to work out, and that's fine. Um, some signs that it might not be working out for you could be you have no engagement, so you are posting consistently, but the reach is limited, no one is liking or sharing your content, and it's just not doing anything. Um, you might not be able to grow your followers. So again, you're posting consistently, you're engaging with people and you just aren't seeing any growth. Um, engagement that you do have is irrelevant. So any comments you're getting on your posts are spam or just follow for follow and not anything that's contributing. Or the platform isn't supporting any of your other marketing efforts or driving traffic to your website. So just one of these issues on their own isn't the end of the world. Um, you can try and address it if you can by maybe modifying what type of content you're posting um, or something like that. But if you have more than one of these issues and you've already tried to address them, it could just be a sign that the platform isn't for you. And that's absolutely fine. Social media takes a lot of time and properly so you don't want to spread yourself too thin you're better off um, moving your folks and your efforts or you spend all of your waking hours a day on, um, and i'm gonna pass it over to alex to explore that perfect sorry we, we lost you there just like the last oh sorry 60 okay. seconds just said, I'm passing it over to you to talk oh, more. Okay. About <laughs> That's all. That was really, that was really great. I have like a page of notes I was taking as I was going through that I will reference back. I like um, Twitter is affluent millennials. And so I would like to know what platform is for paycheck to paycheck Gen Xers. <laughs> Cause that's, I think uh, an audience that I have a lot in common with. Um, so thank you. Um, what we're going to do now is kind of build on um, what Katie talked about around audience and content and calendars and really you know find ways one of the things that, that katie said is you know having a content calendar is a great way to avoid having to scramble on a monday morning and find things to post i think if, if any of you have done social media for uh for an organization or for a business um you, you've all been there i know i'm usually there um could have been this morning, I might have been there in the same position. So uh, what I'm going to go over now are a couple ways of thinking about how to build out that content calendar. So, you know, understanding what platforms you have, who your audience is and how you're talking to them and what your ultimate goal is in terms of traffic. So whenever um, I'm thinking about social media is what is the job of that? Do I want to drive engagement? Do I want to drive awareness? Do I want to drive people to my website to get more information, to sign up to volunteer, uh, to learn about um, donation opportunities, um, which I think for, for many of us, that's that's what we're trying to do. Um, so I'm gonna go through a couple of things here. Um, I can advance, forgot I can advance my own slides. So, um, so what we're gonna talk about is repurposing content. So uh, 
I'm a, I'm a big believer in recycling, and I think that we should all be recycling our content as much as possible. Uh, so we're going to go over a couple different things here. And I just thought of something else as I talked, so I'm going to write that down as a note. Um, so when we think about what anchor content is, the anchor content is what we would use for repurposing. And that could be everything from our websites uh, to blog posts, if you have a podcast, if it's a, like a podcast one of your like board members or directors or volunteers is on, um, if it's a video, whether it's a video that you've made yourself or someone else has made for you, finding those items um, and seeing how you can actually reuse them uh, across the board, right? The other, the other great thing about this is it gives you a lot of room to experiment. So um, if you have messaging set up for your, for your organization, um, social media is a great way to test that messaging as you're going, especially if you're doing any kind of rework on your mission statement, your values, um, you're trying different campaign ideas. Social gives you those opportunities to kind of try some things out, see what sticks, see what doesn't, uh, and then make some adjustments as you're going. So it's a great, especially because it's so, well, it's technically temporary. I mean, people can look up what you've posted in the past, so you should always delete your tweets, but uh, generally it's pretty ephemeral and you can kind of have some fun with it. Um, so we're gonna go through a couple different things, uh, different types of anchor content. Um, so number one is your website. So if you've spent time and money and resources building out this website um, that you have, it's a great source of content that you can use. Uh, this is an example of one where a company has uh, different services they offer, um, and then what they've done is they've actually turned those into social posts. Um, so throughout your site, whether it's you know donation opportunities, volunteering opportunities, um, you know success stories, anything like that that you have on your site, those are things that you can easily um, either you know use um, photography that you have um, or. Um, Third party, like free, like Unsplash, which you can download license free or royalty free uh, photos for use, um, or just you know make a you know a quick graphic in, in a free tool like Figma or Canva, um, and throw that up. And the cool thing with this is again is you're using your website messaging, so you've spent some time on that already. Um, hopefully, you know that some of that works, but you can also experiment and tweak things. So maybe you have a version of of a, of a, a call to donation on your site. You can try variations of that on, on social media and see which ones are actually uh, getting more traction to your site. Um, and then you might end up changing the messaging on your website if some stuff is working, uh, is working better than others. Um, across the board, this is a great way to do it. Um, the great thing about this is this content can be used on different platforms. So whether you know, you're talking about a Facebook post or an Instagram post, or Twitter, um, you can kind of find the ones that work better. I like the way that Katie went through and kind of broke down the ones that work. Um, what I find super interesting is um, Instagram and behind the scenes. So especially if you're an organization that has, as we're getting you know, back to normal and things are more open, um, you know, if you look at like the food bank does a really good job of showing uh, you know, people sorting and packing, right? So that's behind the scenes action. You can see what being a volunteer is. Um, Habitat for Humanity, um, you can you can see that and actually have a, a really good opportunity to show volunteering in action. Um, I'm still I, I built a, a framed a wall for a Habitat for Humanity house and I always want to go back and see if it's still there and I fingers crossed it is. Um, but they had really good volunteers on site who made sure we were doing what we need to do. Um, but again, that's website stuff. Um, the other one now is blog posts. So if you're doing any kind of blogging on your website. Um, this is great content that you can reuse across your social media channels. Um, if you focus on doing ones, and, and this is when you kind of get back into uh, how you plan out your content, um, top five, top 10 way posts are really great. They, they do well in SEO, um, so people will discover them, they look good on social. But the great thing is, is that you can take those top five or top 10 or top seven posts and uh, break those down into content. So um, if you had top five reasons to donate at Charity X. Um, you can, eat, you know, if you're doing it on Instagram, you could do a carousel post where you'd have five images um, and then the copy of the post could be all five of those. If you're doing it on Twitter, you could do a, a, a Twitter thread, which is basically just starting with one tweet and adding onto it. Um, and then it's easily shareable, people can find it. Um, okay, yeah. Oh yeah, we're gonna get in the podcast next. That's the next one. Thank you, Rose. Um, sorry, I was just looking at the, at the questions. Um, the other great thing with those posts as well is um, if you invest in 
the, the content for them. Those are great things that can be used in, in physical uh, assets too. So whether you're doing mailers or flyers, um, even posters, right? It's, it's a cool way. You might have a, a great top five reasons to donate post or volunteer post. That could be uh, you know, artwork in your office or in your space to you. So um, something really good to look at. Um, the next is podcasts. So Rose asked in the Q and A uh, if, if people haven't, uh, for people who haven't done podcasts, um, what kind of content you should use, platforms and ideas. Um, this is a really great one. Podcasts um, are extremely popular in Kitchener Waterloo. Um, there must be probably a couple hundred at this point. Uh, Midtown Radio, which is a, a hyper local radio station. Uh, rebroadcast many of them. Um, I can share out some through with the notes on the meeting too to, to check out. Um, podcasts are really great because um, one, it's an opportunity for someone from your organization to talk about why you do what you do, who, who are you providing service to, um, how you do it, um, what your challenges are, what you use donations for, volunteering opportunities, uh, donor opportunities, um, and the, the best part about podcasts is usually you would interview a guest. So maybe, you know, you're, you're at an organization, you have a volunteer, and uh, they come in, they talk about why they got into volunteering, what motivates them, um, what they get out of volunteering for your organization, why they chose to give back. Um, and those, it's great content because you're able then, when you share that on your own channels, whether you share that on LinkedIn or Twitter or on your website, um, they're going to repost it and share it too. Um, so, and the, that even goes more for donors. So if you have a, a business or uh, an individual who's made a significant donation to your organization, inviting them on to kind of talk about why they donated their business, what, how they build uh, giving back into their organization um, or, or into their kind of, you know, personal thing or their, their family life, um, they will share that on their network. So if you have a business leader who's then sharing it on their company LinkedIn page or their personal LinkedIn page, it's expanding the reach of, uh, of your content, which is the most important thing. Um, it's really critical to know, like it's great that when you tweet about stuff that you're doing or post about stuff that you're doing, but it's 10 times better when someone else is posting about what you're doing. Um, Cause you wanna be on their channels and on their network and reaching people that you've never reached before. Um, ah, look at this, as a charity, how can we find local podcasts that we may be a good fit for I might have to save these for the end. I'm just going to go ahead and do it now. Um, we'll send out a list. Um, there's a couple in town that are really good. Bond Park is one out of Waterloo. Um, and they bring on guests all the time. And it's, it's basically local people doing awesome things locally. Um, there's another one that names escapes me at the moment, but I'll remember it. Um, but yeah, we'll include these in the post event email uh, with those to send out. Um, there's a lot of great services for producing podcasts. So this does not have to cost you a ton of money. And one of the things that I like to do when we talk about repurposing is finding free tools or free trial tools um, or, or nice, quick and easy ways to get things done that can get you really good value for, for your content. Um, there's a service called Anchor FM, um, and it is a free podcast production and hosting tool. Um, and what's really great about it is basically if you, you know, record, if you have a, a laptop with audio software, um, like a Mac with GarageBand or an iPad with GarageBand, that's really all you need to produce a podcast. I mean, having microphones and everything else is perfect, um, but you can use that to, um, to, to um, host your podcast. It'll actually take care of all the legwork. Um, so if people choose to listen to podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google, there's an Amazon podcast app. Um, Anchor for free distributes your podcast to all those platforms. So when you say, hey, go on Apple Podcasts and find the SVP podcast, um, it's as it's, it's discoverable as any other podcast out there. So it's a nice and easy way to do it. Um, there is another service called Transistor FM. Um, it does basically the same stuff Anchor does. It's a paid service. Um, it's not super expensive, um, but it just gives you better analytics. Um, so you, you get uh, kind of a deeper look at who's listening to your podcast on what platforms, how long they're listening for, where Anchor is more 20 people listen this week and you kind of don't get a ton, but it's free, so it's good. Um, in terms of production, um, Midtown Radio, which I mentioned before, they have a studio at 44 Gockle in downtown Kitchener, um, and they're very interested in, in, um, in having people come and use their space to produce podcasts. And Kitchener Public Library has three 
studios, audio production studios in their Hefner studio, uh, right when you walk in on the left of uh, the central library. And those spaces are available to, to rent for free and you can produce your podcast in there. And they have the headphones, the microphones and everything you'd ever need to do it along with some uh, really great volunteers who can walk you through it. So um, for basically almost nothing, you could, other than time uh, and effort, you can put together a podcast. Uh, what's really great about, again, podcasts, they're very shareable. People want to promote them, especially with their guests. Um, but you can take those podcasts and break them into smaller content to use across your social channels. Um, so there's a thing called a waveform. You might have seen it if you're scrolling through Instagram. And it basically looks like it's, it's a visualization of the sound. So it's like a wave and it, and it moves and, and people will put that over a photo of their guest um, and then do a 30 second clip on Instagram or a minute clip on um, LinkedIn or Twitter as a kind of a preview for why you would listen to it. Um, there's Anchor FM um, and in Get Audiogram, which I've listed here, are both free tools that will do it. Um, there's some paid ones as well that I've listed as well uh, in there too. They just have kind of better control over what you, you make with it and removing um, logos and things. But um, audio is one of the things you don't naturally think is, is super great to share on a visual platform like Instagram. But when you create a visualization of that sound and show the guest's face, it can do really well for you. Um, the other part too is, is looking at as you're doing your podcast planning. So if you were going to do an interview with a donor, um, it's great to do and you know, podcasts can range anywhere from half an hour to an hour. Um, I don't have that attention span to listen for more than 30 minutes. So I'm very much a 30 minute podcast kind of person. And then after that, I, I forget what happened. But um, what's a, a really big trend right now is what are called mini episodes. And so as you're recording your podcast, um, you you ask a question specifically that's maybe like a two to five minute answer. Um, and then you release that separately as a bit of a preview. So people are, are promoting, hey, we're going to have so-and-so CEO of this company who donated a million dollars to our charity. Um, and here's a quick thing on why they value giving back. And that's your five minute preview. And then the next week you have the whole episode. So um, it's a little bit of a teaser or a trailer. You're building up a, an audience and, and building up anticipation in that audience to, to come and check out that episode. Um, the same thing kind of goes for video um, as we get into the, the, visual, uh, the visual side of things. Um, if you've done um, any kind of like, you know, per, like, like well-produced videos, or maybe you're just doing behind the scenes videos in your office, um, there's a couple things you can do with that. So even if you're just shooting with your iPhone, um, and there's a bunch of free courses that we'll send out to that, that give you kind of tips and tricks for shooting video with a phone. Um, there's a bunch of free tools available that can, you can do quick edits. Um, so Adobe Spark um, and Adobe Premiere Rush are available um, on iPads and iPhones, and I think Android devices too. Um, and they let you just quickly add a graphic, a logo, um, sometimes, you know, sound if you, if you have, you know, music clips, and they have some free stuff in there you can use. But it's a way just to do a quick visual thing. Um, I know Katie talked about TikTok as a, as a platform um, that's, that's rapidly growing. Um, that I do not understand and my kids try to show me and I just completely give up. Um, and even though I believe in continuous learning, it, it stops with TikTok. Um, but uh, taking you know, a video that you maybe have done for YouTube and grabbing 30 seconds, that makes sense. You could repurpose that for a TikTok or for an Instagram reel um, and use it there, which is really uh, fun to do. The other thing is, uh, is GIFs. Um, so GIFs are, are animated uh, clips of video with some text over them. Um, there's Giphy.com and Gif Brewery, which are two free tools that let you take any video clip, um, set a beginning and an end, and it just turns it into an animated GIF that you can then share on Twitter. Um, so if you have video that works for that, it, it's a really good you know, kind of thing to check out and do. Um, yeah, the other part too is like, again, like repurposing video that you've done. So if you you know have a video, uh, like someone shot video as you're, you're in a, volunteer situation, um, finding those clips and just, you know, making short animated things of them to share on social media um, or combining a whole bunch of them together with some background track and just make a, you know, just a video that kind of grabs people's attention, keeps them on uh, from, from scrolling up or down on, on Instagram or Twitter. Okay, and then there was um, one other thing I wanted to talk about, which is uh, newsletters. Um, so newsletters are technically a social um, channel, but they are a channel for getting your news out there. Um, if you don't have one yet, there's a number of free tools um, that you can get started with. 
Um, MailChimp has a free tier. Um, there's a service called Substack, uh, which is started by a UW grad um, that also is completely free. Um, and the great thing about newsletters is, you know, you have most of your content there. So if you're doing one or two blog posts a month, that goes in your newsletter. Um, if someone tweeted about volunteering with your charity or donating to your charity, that can, you know, you can screenshot that or, or and sometimes it's like just copy the link and paste it in. Um, you have all this, you know, stuff that's happening every, every week or every month. Um, that's really great for newsletter. The best thing about newsletters is that they're they're passive, right? So with social media, you log in, you're scrolling, you can get distracted, you click on a link to go somewhere else. Um, with newsletters, they're sitting in your inbox, um, they're there to read, uh, you might see something you like, and then you forget about it, but then you're reminded of it a day or two later, and it's still sitting in your inbox and go back and find it. So where social media content is, you know, so ephemeral and kind of disappears, your newsletters in your, your inbox forever, unless you delete it, uh, in which case it doesn't really work. Um, but again, you have all this great content that you're doing every week. You're doing blogs, you're doing social, people are, are talking about you. Reusing that inside a newsletter um, is, is really helpful. Um, the other part about newsletters too is that social media, as Katie said, is so full of noise. Um, there's just, you know, I forget what the average number of tweets was, but the last time I did a presentation on it, I think it was like eight tweets every second or something ridiculous. Um, and if you're trying to fight that noise, it's hard. Newsletters are, you know, you can personalize them a little bit more. Um, your frequency can, can be based on, on how often it makes sense for you. So some organizations might just do a monthly newsletter. Some might do every week. Again, it, it, you're respecting your audience and what they need to know. If there are opportunities to donate or volunteer or get involved and they're happening and they change on a weekly basis and then a weekly cadence, is, it makes the most sense. Um, if you're kind of more of a monthly, hey, you know, in January, here's gonna be the opportunities once a month is great. Um, but like anything, like the same with social, where they're, you know, posting on Twitter at a certain cadence makes sense versus posting on Instagram at a different one. Um, newsletters, it's basically like every week or once a month. Um, quarterly don't really work because you're not building an audience. You're not building kind of a, a trust and value with your newsletter audience. Uh, where monthly, you're pretty much respecting them and weekly can be a little, a little much unless you, you have new stuff every week that you want to reach with. So um, yeah, that's, that's my part on this. I don't have a good transition because there's no one after me. Let's do this. It's just me, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so we do have a few questions. So I'll, thank you, Alex and Katie. We'll switch into the Q&A por portion before we finish off. And I do have some questions here. Um, following up, on, I'm just double checking Rose's question here. Did we hit all the, and she has like multiple questions in one question. Um, oh, I think we, you answered all the questions about podcasts there, Alex. I do have a couple others. I'm just sorry, pulling up the notes here. Uh, this one's for Katie. Uh, so social media platforms, what if none of them are working? It, yeah, it could happen. Um, I would suggest probably going back and taking a look and making sure that your content suits your audience and that your audience is definitely on that platform. Um, if you're hundred percent positive that your audience is there and your content is relevant, um, you could try reaching out to people within your own network that might have a larger following. Um, so it could be volunteers, um, employees, donors that have a large following and could reshare some of your content just to hit a larger network. Um, you can also experiment with your content. So if you've been posting the same kind of type for a while, you could use different images, try video, um, throw in some emojis just to break it up and try to stand out a little bit more. Because as Alex said, like, it's so easy to get lost in the noise on Facebook or on any social media platform that you just need to find ways that you can stand out. Um, and then you just have to keep in mind that if you're only doing organic growth on social media, it's not going to happen overnight. So it's kind of a long game. So just keep being consistent. Um, make sure that your messaging lines up with the audience that you're trying to reach. And you could also look into doing some like sponsored posts or um, boosting on social media platforms as a last resort if you have some budget to spend on it. Those are some great um, notes. Another one I have kind of connected to it. Uh, what should I do if I'm not sure where my audience is most likely to be? Um, you can, I mean, if you go 
online and just kind of Google which each platform is targeted for, you can find some pretty good information about that. Um, if you're really not sure though, it's just, it's mostly trial and error with social media as to what's gonna work and what's not gonna work. Um, so I would probably start with Facebook and Instagram because they do have very large platforms um, and just see what you can do there. And then try out each platform, see if you can get anything to stick and then go from there. All right, and leading into that, do you find photos or videos get more engagement than just text posts? In my experience, yes. Um, we kind of experimented with the company that I work for recently trying photos versus videos and our video posts are like double the engagement that our um, just photos are even. And then if we post something that's text only, it's very low engagement. I think people just, people are drawn to visuals. So the more visuals you can include, um, and just the more interesting visuals you can include, the better. I find it goes text, photo, video, photos and videos of dogs. Yes. Very high engagement. You put yeah. a dog through the roof. No dog, definitely not going right. to do well. I'm going to just start, I, I need people to send me their dog photos. I don't <laughs> have one, then I'll just start posting them for SVP. Uh, building on that, uh, Kitty or Alex, uh, the videos. Now, is there... I don't, I'm not on TikTok, but we're on Instagram. Is there usually a, a limit? What, what would you recommend for how long a video should be on Instagram? I think on Instagram, probably not too long. Um, I don't know what the limit even like is a, to post on Instagram. Like, I think the limit on reels is- Like a minute, isn't it? A minute, like, yeah, and TikTok's a little bit longer. And then like the long form Instagram, I think it's 15 minutes now. Yeah. But still like usually, usually the long form Instagram is you're just doing the same thing you do on YouTube. People have short attention spans on social media. So you want to really grab them and be able to tell them what you want to tell them in like 30 seconds. And then, cause they're going to move on really quickly. My thing with, with TikTok and then it's like Rose asked, like, do we have to use TikTok? Um, I, I had a client ask me about it and I was like, listen, like you need, they, they're very, it's a, they're in their office. It's very like visually awesome. There's stuff happening. I'm like, you need a person full-time doing this um, who's younger and understands the memes and the dances because I just, you know, again, like as, as I assume all of us are a little bit older on this. Um, yeah, it's just, it, it's too, like, I don't have, I can't do it, right? It's just one of those, there's too much. I can tweet a thousand times a day. It's not hard to do, but one TikTok video, I'm just like, <laughs> That's all the energy I had for the day. Uh, uh, totally fair. Um, I think Rose just said, yeah, Rose, like, uh, yeah, I, I, Rose, I'm not doing TikTok. I can't do dances either. Uh, and then actually building on, I guess this is kind of actually going away from social media for a second there. We have a question here about, and I'm sure Alex will send out a little more information, but any suggestions for a good free stock image site? I use unsplash.com. Um, they're, they're, you're supposed to give credit to the, the person who took it. And I usually do. Um, if it's a blog post at the bottom or if it's a, a newsletter, I kind of include it at the bottom as well. It's harder on social to do that. Um, they've got a lot of great stuff on there. Um, almost anything you can think of. The only problem is that everyone else uses it too. So um, there'll be times like I'll read an article on, on Forbes or Fast Company and it's like an unsplash image I used for like a local, I'm like, either they're like not doing a good job or I'm doing a great job. I can't tell. Um, the other thing too, is like, even if you're, if you're thinking about it again, you know, all our phones have great cameras now, um, even kind of going through and spending some time going, Hey, on Thursday, we're doing this volunteer activity and we're going to come and just take a bunch of pictures, have a, a shot sheet. Hey, we need three people packing boxes. We need someone holding a clip or, you know, those kind of things and build up your own um, stock photography thing, you can reuse them. So just because you take a photo or you use a photo once in November, doesn't mean you can't use it again in January, right? Again, it's on any social platform, they're just going to cycle through and people will forget and no one's going to like call you on, you know, wearing the same, you know, shirt twice in a week. And just building on that, I've been using Canva um, at SVP. I know they have a free version and Canva has been great to kind of modify photos or add text and information. Uh, it makes those of us who are not overly creative um, look very creative. Uh, and then I know I had a, another question. I'm going to have to, sorry, just going up through the chat here. Um, and then going, so going back to social media, 
How do you drive growth on social channels, Alex? So one of the things that um, I learned a little bit ago um, that I thought was really interesting on Instagram, it's, it's kind of hard, especially if you're starting off a new channel or you have one that's stagnant, is how do you build that up? Um, and so someone told me basically you spend 10 minutes a day finding 20 posts that are about the thing that you you want to talk about and then make it like it and comment it like comment on it so you know if you, if your organization um like like say you're the food bank and you look for other food banks um across canada or even in the u.s or you look for people who are posting about volunteering at food banks hey that's great so great you're volunteering at the at such and such food bank people want to be engaged with, right? So they'll they'll look, they'll come back to your account. Maybe they're really interested in, in whatever your charity is and they'll follow you back. So it's a great way of, of them either, if they reply, hey, thanks so much, maybe they'll follow your account and then comment on your posts. Um, it takes effort, right? Again, it's like, you know, 10 minutes a day, find 20 posts. You can search by hashtag, um, but you'll find after two to three weeks of doing that, you start to see, people following you. And then those people who follow you are usually more engaged because you've engaged with them. They remember that. Awesome. And if you have any other questions, keep them coming. I have one. Uh... Oh, here's one. Uh, thoughts on purging followers that seem like inappropriate accounts. Cut them. I bl block all the time. Yeah. If they're, if they're, if you can tell it's like, the account was created November, 2021. They have no followers and everything is about, you know, Donald Trump. Yeah. You can block them. Like there's no, yeah. Uh, That's, no, no. Sure. I'm pretty, I'm pretty like, yeah. Block is my favorite button right now. <laughs> awesome. And then I have, again, keep them coming. I have another one over here. How do you know if something is worth so I feel like we're just bouncing back and forth with questions here, but social media is so over Katie. How do you know something is working on social media and how do you measure success? Um, so you have to go back to like whatever your goals were that you started. So um, typically like we would look at how much the reach is, like, is it reaching people? Um, is anybody engaging with it? So how many likes, comments, um, shares are you getting on that post? Um, those are pretty easy metrics to kind of gauge. Um, you could also use like your follower metrics as um, kind of a gauge for how your posts are performing. Because if your followers are increasing, people likely are interested in what you're posting. Um, so just all of the metrics that are available. And you can like on most platforms, you can download those analytics and just kind of analyze them week to week. Um, but it's really dependent on what your goals were at the very start before you started running your channel. Awesome. Thank you. And I think I'm just sorry, grabber. You can use the quick TikTok grabber to track eyeballs. Uh, it's very true, Jenny. And what I do like about TikTok, I, again, I'm not on TikTok, but I've, you notice it on Instagram. So it, it has that cross-platform uh, eyeballs. And how close should creating content that relates directly to our strategic priorities? So creating, I guess, I th sorry, I'm just rereading this. Creating content that relates directly to strate strategy and priorities. I guess how close should content be um, on socials? I, I think that comes back to like to to what Katie talked about with the calendar, right? And if it's your, you know, if, if you're uh, you have donation opportunities or volunteer opportunities um, that a lot obviously those hopefully align with your strategy and priorities. Like those are are great content. I always find then too it's the uh, like complementary organizations or uh, public programs or just people out there talking about the thing. You know, if you're involved, if you're a house of friendship and, you know, housing is obviously part of, of that. Um, there's a lot of conversations around housing policy, both uh, federally and provincially and municipally. Municip municipal? Well, that makes sense. Um, and uh, and you can, you can, you know, reshare that, you know, you can retweet things with your own bit of, hey, you know, so-and-so is talking about the need for cooperative housing and this is what we think, right? To find other ways. And again, that's another way to, to build engagement and following because if someone's you know, really active about talking about an issue they're passionate about and it aligns with, with your, strat or your, um, your priorities, retweeting it, engaging with it, you know, it, it amplifies them and then in turn it amplifies your messaging. Perfect. I don't have any more questions. I think we got through all of them. 
last call for questions. Um, and if not, uh, that does conclude this presentation today. So again, I want to thank Alex and Katie for taking the time to prep and present with us today. They've seen a lot of me over the last couple of weeks. They're wonderful and they want to come back because again, this is, uh, we want to do a bit of a series. We're also hoping to do switch up the format uh, for the next one. We, we've talked about maybe do a, a couple potential options. So we'll try and switch it up from this. Uh, we might not do a webinar, it might be more of a Zoom, but be on the lookout for that early in the new year. And yes, I wrote both Alex and Katie to come back. Uh, and so thanks again. I'll send an update and the recording um, once it's all ready to go. So be on the lookout for that in the next couple of days. And again, thanks again and have a great afternoon.